Community Matters with me, Jay Fidel, and Rabbi Itchel Krasnjanski of Chabad of Hawaii. Welcome back, Rabbi. It's always nice to see you. It's a spiritual uplifting for me. Thank you, Jay. Hopefully we won't disappoint you today. <laughs> let's, let's talk about one thing before we get to the holiday you know, theme we've been working on. And that is a movie called uh, The Devil Next Door. It's about uh, John Demjanjik, um, which is, I guess, a Polish name. I'm not sure. Um, and uh, Demjanjik was um, living uh, in Cleveland. He had married. Uh, he had a couple of kids. Um, he, he went to church, Catholic. Uh, and uh, he... And one day, um, the federal authorities uh, arrested him and uh, deported him because uh, it had been determined, uh, they determined, uh, that he had been a war criminal. And he, uh, the United States was not going to try him, just deport him. And he wound up being deported to Israel, where they tried him uh, as Ivan the Terrible. Now, Ivan the Terrible was famous uh, in uh, Treblinka the prison camp, and um, he, he was um, really an awful human being, uh, and he, he, uh, he, he tortured people, he did horrible things to them. I don't even want to repeat on the air the kinds of things he did to them. On the way to the crematoria, in other words, they would arrive on the train, and within a very short time, they were marched into the crematorium, and I guess some of them realized that this was not really a shower. It was a... Um, it was uh, the gas, and uh, Cyclone 2, was it? Cyclone 2. And uh, they realized that they were going to their deaths, and they, 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 they struggled, they complained, they tried to you know, resist. And um, Ivan the Terrible was there with a bayonet, and he would bayonet them, he would cut them. I mean, cut their flesh off, cut, cut people, um, do terrible things to them. Uh, in order to make it clear, they had a... They had to go in there now. Um, so he was really awful. And a lot, of, a lot of the survivors, there was 77 survivors from Treblinka. Um, a lot of survivors knew. Testified that, that he was. Yeah, uh, Ivan the Terrible. <clears throat> so they brought this guy, Demjanjik, <clears throat> who had lived in peace and tranquility in Cleveland since the war. And in the 80s is when they deported him back to uh, Israel. And they had a trial that lasted a year. And uh, they had a, a pretty aggressive defense counsel, Israeli defense counsel. They had an American, uh, also defense counsel. Demjanjik fired him in the middle of the trial. Um, and uh, they had a prosecutor, who I thought was a very decent guy. And there were troubling issues about some of the documents and the testimony by the Israeli survivors. It was a very famous trial in Israel. Everybody was watching it. All the survivors were watching it on television. It was a televised trial. Uh, it was like Eichmann, but it was 20 years after Eichmann, 25 years after Eichmann. Um, and it caught everybody's attention. So he was convicted, and he was sentenced to hang, which is what the Israeli law said about war criminals of this nature. Um, but at the last minute, um, there was additional evidence found that added on to reasonable doubt, now, that it wasn't, that he was not Ivan the Terrible. He always, Ivan the, uh, yeah, uh, Ivan the, Ivan the Terrible, I think. Um, and this was a, in addition to other evidence that caused you to have a little doubt about whether he was, in fact, this monster man. And um, th there were photographs, there was uh, descriptions, in some, of the, in some of the writings in the, in, found in Germany. Um, and it led to, um, you know, more doubt. And it went to the Supreme Court and the Supre of Israel. And the Supreme Court of Israel said there was enough doubt to be reasonable doubt. Um, and uh, they, they, uh, they reversed it. And uh, they... they um, Exonerated him? Hmm? They exonerated him? He was found they, not guilty? They, well, essentially, uh, yeah. They found him not guilty. Even though there was evidence that he had been a guard, a, a really nasty guard, in the nearby Sobibor in Poland. Both of these camps were in Poland. And so because of that, uh, the, the courts in Israel decided, well, 
they, they took him on a deportation over the one charge, um, I, Ivan Monster. Um, and they, uh, it was really interesting. I mean, it's from a legal point of view because there was evidence pointing both ways. But they, they acquitted him in the Supreme Court and, and they reversed the deportation, sent him back to the U.S. where he joined his family. And he was living there for, I don't know, a while, years. When the um, U.S. attorney for Cleveland found other evidence suggests that he was also a really bad guard in Sobibor. So although he wasn't Ivan in Treblinka, he was Ivan or a bad guard. His name was, middle name was Ivan. Um, um, so they did another deportation. To Israel. Yeah. Uh, second deportation, and this was, uh, I guess, on the, later on, a few years later, maybe the 90s, and um, successfully deported him, this time to Germany, to stand trial in Germany. And uh, Germany convicted him of being a monster guard in uh, Sobibor. Um, <clears throat> but he, he appealed that. And while the appeal was pending, it, it pended for a long time, uh, and he was in jail in Germany, he, he, uh, he died. And the law in Germany provided that uh, if, you, if you die pending an appeal, it is presumed that, that you were never convicted. So he died uh, an unconvicted um, man. Okay, this is this, uh, by the way, the, the Israeli survivors were just wild about this. I mean, to have the conviction reversed in Israel, to send him back for his uh, family life in Cleveland really upset the country. Hey, okay, that's, that's the end of the story. This is a documentary called uh, The Devil Next Door, and it's about this. It's five episodes on Netflix. It is a very well done documentary. And I saw it last night. All five? All five? Yeah, I binged on it. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody, okay. you know, advised me about this. I binged on it. Well, in the morning in the paper, just so happens, today, today, Rabbi, there was an article, I think it was the Times or the Post or maybe the Guardian, and it's about Poland, the prime minister of Poland. Now, you know there's a law in Poland that says anybody who uh, claims uh, that Poland was involved in the killing of the Jews is, is guilty of a crime. So if you say that, that the Polish people were responsible in any way for the, you know, and this, this is um, anti-Semitic law. Sure it is, because the <laughs> reality is that the Poles were as vicious, many Poles were as vicious as the Nazis. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so the, the prime minister sees this thing on Netflix. I guess they get Netflix there. And he... He's making a global statement uh, against Netflix uh, for making the movie because, and I, I have to read it again, but because, because the, the movie um, includes the fact that there were at least these two camps in Poland, Treblinka and Sobibor. It's really all about those two death camps. And he says, you can't say that. You can't say that the... That in the, you know, oh. the, the, yeah, in, 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 the, in, in Poland, we had death camps. We didn't, we didn't have that. And, and um, he's like denying the whole Holocaust. He's denying these death camps existed in Poland. Incredible. Today, right now, the prime minister of Poland. I can't tell you how I feel about Poland. I mean, I'm into truth, you know, aren't you? Truth, truth helps. And we need to have truth all around us. And um, he's saying that, oh, no, this wasn't true and it's a violation of Polish law. Wow. So this, you're going to see more about this. You're going to see a controversy about this. And if you have a chance, and I'm telling everybody, if you have a chance, take a look at this really well-done documentary about the life and um, fortune, misfortune where, where was, of uh, uh, John Demjanjuk. Demian, yeah. uh, Auschwitz, was that in Poland? Uh, Auschwitz. I think that was in Germany. That's Germany. I think so, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, anyway, you know, these controversies are alive, and one of the reasons they're alive is that there's plenty of anti-Semitism in Europe, uh, and it becomes very, and in the U.S., I might add, and it becomes, you know, newsworthy. It, be, it becomes, the, it generates controversy. Good for Netflix for covering this. Uh, not to say, you know, that Net, Netflix did not, it was just reporting the news. This was, uh, and hard to say balanced, but, you know, this was um, just the facts, man. 
about what happened to him. And it raised all kinds of interesting questions about uh, how did he get in the country? How did he slip through after 1945? Was he the only one? He worked at the Ford Motor Company, and there was a suggestion that Ford had allowed others like him to participate, to lead quiet lives, making cars uh, in, in uh, Cleveland, in this case, but maybe other cities too. So we, you know, we have a serious anti-Semitic problem that existed in the 1930s, in the 1940s, after the war, after it was clear what they had done. And I suggest that hasn't really stopped. And it goes to a discussion I always want to have with you about the status of anti-Semitism. Um, you know, we have, uh, we, put these, uh, we put these videos up there on YouTube, and we get comments on YouTube that are clearly and absolutely anti-Semitic. I sent one to you this week, um, and I'm, I'm, it's hard to describe the reaction you have. Is that, you know, we said never again because six million people perished. In, in, in an awful Holocaust, um, and still, it's not never again, it's again. Well, you don't have to go further than what's happening to Israel today. The BDS movement and the whole anti-Israel is really another form of anti-Semitism. The UN is riddled with anti-Semitism. Yeah. What else can you explain? You know, all of those uh, actions taken against the one single country, Israel. I think there's more resolutions against Israel than against all other countries in the world combined, including all the horrible countries that we know. Yeah. Like Iran and North Korea. And yeah. Yeah, horrible that, uh, and, and the people from BDS, and that's a whole new story. You and I had a show about that a couple of years ago. Um, they, they don't complain against those other countries, just, just against Israel, the one civilized country in the area, the one country that doesn't, that doesn't involve itself in, um, you know, hate, violence, all that. So, I mean, what are we going to do, Rabbi? This is very disturbing because when I was a kid, it was all about never again. Mm. It, was about, it was about making the desert bloom in Israel in the kibbutzim. It's about making a, a, a safe haven for Jews, um, about never again. And so much literature, so many movies have been made. And yet there are those people today, 2019, who deny it happened. You know, Anti-Semitism is a very, very fascinating phenomenon. It's been around forever. It has. Um, the motivation for anti-Semitism has been everything under the sun. Jews are too rich, too poor, too smart, too communist, too capitalist. Too, you know, it, it's really uh, a very inexplicable hatred that's uh, hard to be explained. But you're right, we have to fight it. And for us Jewish people, what's, what's equally important is that we as Jews need to learn to define ourselves not by the fact that they hate us, so therefore we have to cling together, but by um, embracing you know, the positive elements of Judaism, the teachings of the Torah, and what we learn about our unique relationship with God, and the love of God to the Jewish people, the people in general, and that has to be the, the bedrock of our identity, not the fact that they hate us. And how do we deal with it? We become victims, though. And I mean, from time to time, there have been responses by Jewish people that, you know, think of the Warsaw Ghetto uh, and other places and situations where the Jews have re rebelled, re Re retaliated, re revolted. Well, for sure we have to retaliate and do everything we can to stop it wherever it rears its ugly head. Um, but at the same time, what I'm saying is that that cannot become our whole identity, you know, in our response to that hatred. Yeah. 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 There's so much um, value in Judaism and being Jewish in the Jewish community and the Jewish traditions 
so much value. We, we have to hold on to that, not only perpetuate it, but enjoy it. And I know you're into that. So let's stop talking about that movie. Okay. Uh, the movie is The Devil Next Door. You can find it on Netflix. I would urge you to take a look at it. Because uh, in this movie, there's footage that will put to rest any possible denial of the Holocaust. Footage I have not seen yet uh, until this movie. Netflix found it, and there are gross things in this movie and show you what the Germans were doing and, and the Poles and the Poles were doing in these camps to the Jews. Okay, let's talk about holidays. We, we have a... We have a sort of a vacation from holidays lately. A lull, a lull in the uh, in the holidays. Yes, we had just come off uh, the month of Tishrei, which is the month packed with holidays, beginning with the High Holy Days, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, then the Jewish festival of Sukkot, which is the feast of the Tabernacle, which culminated with Simchas Torah dancing and rejoicing with the Torah. And that was one of my favorite ones, yeah. Simcha's Torah. Yeah. In my neighborhood, they did it in the street. Yes. They, they walked in so the street those... with the Torahs, too. And they sang, and they made a big simus yes. all over the neighborhood. Yes, yes. It's still, it's still <laughs> happening today. And, um, and then we enter into a quiet period, which in the Hebrew calendar this month is called Cheshven. And it's unique from all of uh, the other Jewish months in the calendar in that there's no holiday uh, in the, throughout the entire month. Almost every other, actually every other Jewish month in the calendar has one special day. Either it's a holiday or, or a national day of mourning like Tisha B'Av or another fast day or... But the month of Cheshvan has no holidays at all. So you go from this high to this very extreme uh, low. And it's a holiday from holidays. <laughs> Maybe they were leaving room for Veterans Day in the U.S. Uh -huh. <laughs> but actually what's interesting is that in the Jewish tradition, the holidays are, are you know, singular days within the calendar. But they're meant to infuse all the other days of the year with its special holiday, holy day, the special holiness of the mm -hmm. message of that holy day. And our task is to take that message into the, into the regular days and to imbue the regular days with meaning and purpose and holiness. So, you know, we serve God in the synagogue, on the Sabbath, prayer and Torah study or the holiday. But we also can and should serve God on the regular day when we work, when we uh, do go through our daily activities. If they're motivated by a higher purpose, then it all becomes service to God. Mm -hmm. If they're motivated by ego and greed and whatever else, then, then, it's, then it's nothing more than uh, something passing. But yeah. if it's, uh, if it's, well, maybe it's an opportunity to integrate the lessons exactly. of the Jewish New Year. Exactly. That is, as you say, those are the high holidays, and now we, maybe we just think about that a little bit, let it soak in. You know? That's true. That's true. These days, the, the holidays are days that are charged with different holidays with different spiritual energies. For example, uh, the holiday of Simchas Torah, that we just mentioned, your favorite holiday. And Sukkot in general is referred to as a time for rejoicing. So where do we draw happiness every day of the year? We draw it from this holiday. And if we don't take from the holiday and apply it to every day, we're missing the point the holiday yeah yeah so much to learn from holidays and you can't let them you can't let holidays go commercial on you uh you can't you know forget the origin and the meaning of the holiday and that's the value of having holidays in any culture uh, that you have this repeating experience every year 
and uh, you are reminded of why it was made a holiday in the first place. Correct. There's always a reason. <laughs> Correct. And you know what's so um, uh, what's so part and parcel of the Jewish religion, as mentioned time and time again in the Torah, and it's related to what you just said, is it's all f all of these many of these holidays. The Torah says it's just so that the generations shall remember. That we have to remember what happened in the past in order for us to appreciate the present and, and, and you know, work towards the future. It's all about remembering. It's about being global, too. I mean, for example, um, I'm reminded of a, uh, another movie about uh, black Jews in Ethiopia uh, that the Mossad spirited out of Ethiopia yes. back in the, uh, not too long ago, actually. Um, and uh, they were conducting the same holidays. They were celebrating the same holidays that any Jew anywhere else does, even though they were black and even though there, you know, there were variations on the theme. <clears throat> but, you know, it's, a, it's of some comfort to know when you're celebrating Simchus Torah um, that Jews around the world are celebrating Simchus Torah. It brings us together, you know. Right. And there, there's a saying from one of the famous rabbis who lived in the 12th century, his name is Rabbi Sadia Gohan, and uh, he writes, his famous saying is that more than the Jewish people have kept the Shabbos, the Shabbos has kept the Jewish people. <laughs> the fact that, uh, especially in, in our day and age when people travel all the time, the fact that you can travel to anywhere in the world, well, if you're there on a Friday or on a Shabbos, and just plug in, and it's it's the same right. as it is all right. over the world. It's, uh, it's a global thing. Yes, yeah. the diaspora has separated us, but it also keeps us together. Exactly. So let's talk about Hanukkah because it's okay. coming up. It's not yes. too far away. Right. You have Thanksgiving, in, uh, you know, I guess in in the European and Western culture, and then bingo, <laughs> you have Hanukkah. Right. Which, uh, which is my second favorite holiday. <laughs> That's because my parents gave me things on Hanukkah. Can yes. you talk about it? Sure. Well, Hanukkah is this year, I'm not sure exactly, but it's coming up in December. And it is uh, a holiday that commemorates a great miracle that happened to the Jewish people during the time of the tail end of the, of, the, um, of the Second Temple in Jerusalem. And the Jews were under the rule of the, um, I'm sorry, the first temple in Jerusalem. Excuse me, let me just orient myself. Yeah, this is the first temple in Jerusalem when the Greek Syrian um, were, um, were uh, in charge at that time. And... Um, and uh, the, uh, the Greek, I'm, I'm confused, is the second or first temple? I think it's the mm -hmm. second temple. I'm okay, second temple, yeah. yeah. So they uh, tried uh, to, there's two holidays that, that commemorate miracles of survival. One is the festival of Purim, which is later on in the year. And one is the festival of Hanukkah. Uh, Purim happened during the, uh, right after the first temple uh, was destroyed, and Hanukkah happened during the second temple, period. And at the time of Purim, there arose a leader, uh, Haman, who wanted to annihilate all the Jewish people, man, woman, and child, like in our generation, Germany, the Nazis, Hitler, as we were talking about before, they were seeking to annihilate the Jewish people. The Greeks were different. They, uh, their problem was not the Jewish people. Their problem was the Jewish way of life, Judaism. And they were seeking to snuff out Judaism. So they uh, issued decrees that made it forbidden the Jews to practice the Sabbath, to practice circumcision. They wanted to Hellenize the Jewish people, that the Jewish people should uh, buy into the Greek culture. The, the, the problem is that the Greek culture and the Jewish culture are a clash of cultures, because the Greek culture uh, deifies uh, man and man and the intellect, 
philosophy. And in Judaism, uh, it's all about God, which is higher than reason. And, and, and there was this, you know, this clash. Their, um, their, their um, uh, inability to accept what the Jewish uh, Torah teaches, you know, that we surrender to a higher authority. But to them, that was uh, very, um, that was, that was wrong. So there was this clash of these two cultures, and they issued all these decrees, and they uh, eventually uh, conquered the Jerusalem and the, um, and de and, and um, went into the temple and um, contaminated, uh, they brought in the idol worship in the temple. And there was a small group of Jewish people led by, um, led by an elderly uh, high priest. They were called the Maccabees. Maccabee in Hebrew is an abbreviation for the word Mika Moicha Be'elim Hashem, which is, a, which is a phrase from the Torah, which means who, like you, uh, who is as strong as Hashem, as God, God being the strongest. And they rallied. Um, uh, they rallied many Jewish people, and they uh, led an uprising against the powerful, mighty Greek Syrian army. And the miracle of Hanukkah is that uh, they were victorious, and they were able to drive away these pow this powerful army. So even though that they were fewer in number, even though they weren't trained soldiers. But their uh, faith in God and their uh, willingness and readiness to sacrifice everything. It's one of those pushback examples, isn't pushback, it? Yeah. Like what you mentioned earlier mm -hmm. in, in, before we went on air, the Warsaw Uprising. Even mm -hmm. though that um, the Jews were outnumbered and outgunned, but they, they kept them at bay for a long, long time. Now this was this Hanukkah is a festival of lights. Correct. It has a lot so, to do yeah, with light. Right. And and, and the uh, I'm sorry I didn't mention that. So what happened was after the Jews were victorious in the military uh, on the military front, they entered into the temple and they cleaned it out and they rededicated the temple. And one of the things that was done in the Jewish temple was they would light the candelabra, the menorah. But the menorah required to have oil, uh, and it had to be pure. It couldn't be uh, defiled. But all the oil that was left in the temple was not pure. Until they found one jug of oil that was only enough to last for one night, and it would take them another seven days to replenish it with pure oil. But they nevertheless went ahead and they lit the menorah, and the miracle of Hanukkah is that the oil that was only enough the last for one night, burned for eight nights. And that's why we have eight days of Hanukkah, and we celebrate this as a very joyous uh, time. And what's fascinating is that the emphasis of this holiday is not the military victory, but the miracle of the lights. The miracle of the lights. Even though one would think that the miracle of the lights is, is like you know, an incidental side story to the big miracle of the military victory. So when we meet next time, Rabbi, I yeah. want to go into greater detail on how Hanukkah is celebrated hither and yon, what it means, uh, the timing, because it's not the same thing as Christmas, right. um, and how it has changed, if at all, over the years. Sure. Uh, in the Christmas season in the sure. U.S., sure. Uh, Christmas affects everything, and so we need to we need to explore how Hanukkah and Christmas get along. Right, and uh, we're actually uh, it's funny because uh, this is something which is something that the Rebbe, the Chabad uh, Lubavitch Rebbe, brought to the world, and that is the Talmud says that the Hanukkah lights are different than the Shabbos candles that are lit Friday night. Friday night uh, we are also instructed to light the candles. The women are instructed to light the candles. That's done in the house. Hanukkah, you're meant to publicize the miracle. So you light the menorah at the window or at the door in front of the house. You're supposed to go out to the public to publicize God's miracle to the public. The Rebbe came out uh, about 40 years ago, a little less, to bring the menorahs to public squares and to the outside. And that's why you have all these menorah lightings 
all around the oh, world. Oh, sure, I know you do that. Yeah. So, you know, the, I, I, wish, I wish this show was like the miracle of the lights, but unfortunately, it only lasts so long. Oh, okay, we'll continue <laughs> so, next time. We're going to have to explore more about Hanukkah next time because I think there's plenty to discuss. With pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Thank Rabbi. You, Rabbi Itchel Krasnodinsky, Chabad of Hawaii. Thank Aloha. you. Aloha. Bye.